Thank you, Megan. How about those grads, am I right? I was getting ready for uh, work this morning, and my wife looked at me and she said, are you going to wear the glasses, babe? And said, anything for you, love. My wife, Macy, graduating with her master's degree, very excited for her. That one was for you. Uh, My name is Nathan Nelson. I'm the resident pastor clown, and uh, I'm the pastor of mission and outreach here at the church. It is a joy to be with you this morning. My hope is that together we can submit ourselves to what the Lord would speak to us through his word. We are continuing in a series called Invitation, in which each week we're looking at different sort of core components of our discipleship, what it means to follow Christ, and we're looking at those in terms of God's invitation to embody those things. So today's topic, as we round the corner from some random dude wearing funky glasses and a crazy crown, to the topic for today, it is justice. I don't know about you, but when I even just hear the word and consider the topic for just a moment, it feels heavy. Does it not? Justice. The invitation to justice. This is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And I have to admit, when I first heard that this was the topic and I would be preaching today, I thought to myself, perfect. That's a layup. What could possibly go wrong? I'll just get up there and just start riffing. It'll be great. No, I have to be honest with you in all seriousness, this sermon has been uniquely challenging for me to prepare. Because I don't know about you, but for me, as I've been serving sort of the landscape of our culture and our world around us, it's not lost on me that we approach this topic in the midst of what feels like profound injustices all around us, glaring us in the eyes. The question for today is amidst all of that, God, where is the justice? Now, just not long ago, we saw horrific injustice, little children being shot dead in their classroom. Our black and Asian brothers and sisters continue to be victims of violence and murder simply for the color of their skin. Our environment is deteriorating under the heavy hand of human consumption. A select few are continuing to get richer than ever before, while others don't even have a place to rest their head at night. And this sort of decades, century-long battle on behalf of women to simply be seen for all that God created you to be continue to experience discrimination, glass ceilings, and daily experiences of mansplaining. If you don't know what that is, turn to the female next to you. They will will inform you. Justice. Amidst all of this, we yearn for justice, do we not? And yet, we remain fearful. We're fearful that we don't want to do the wrong thing. We don't want to say the wrong thing. Because in our culture today, we ourselves might be, quote, canceled, right? There's no room for nuance. And that itself feels unjust. And I'd be remiss to say that even while we sit comfortably within these walls and consider this topic justice in a theoretical sense, there are people around the world in our own city, maybe even listening to this right now, who are themselves experiencing life-threatening injustices. Friends, this is where we are as we approach the topic for today. Can you feel the weight of it? I do. And yet, perhaps that is the very reason that we need this invitation to justice now as much as ever. Amen? I believe wherever you are on the spectrum of fearful, worn out, tired, exhausted from the the next thing that might come out in the news, maybe you feel yourself feeling even apathetic, or maybe you yourself are a victim of injustice. 
Wherever you are on that spectrum, I believe passionately that God has a word for you today, for me today. So in a moment, we're going to pray. And as we pray, would you be so bold as to take courage that maybe there is, in fact, a word for you in these moments about justice? Let's pray. Father God, it's our desire as we approach this topic, Lord, to both lament the profound injustices around us and, Lord, to take a risk, expose ourselves to the possibility, Lord, that you do have a vision for a kingdom of God in which all people in all places, shalom and peace are made known. Lord, may we be inspired as to the true reality of this and our role in it in these these times of listening for your word. So meet us now, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I worked for a short-term mission organization. And I would travel all over Central and South America and work with volunteer groups from churches and all kinds of different settings. And as I did this, I got to meet all kinds of amazing different people, both on the teams that came and then also, of course, in the different communities we were working in. And on one occasion, I uh, was working with a group and I was told on this group there was a spiritual director. Now, how many of you have experienced or have heard of this notion of a spiritual director before? Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of you. I didn't. I didn't really grow up in the church. I had no concept of kind of what this was. And so I was actually really curious. I kind of thought like, maybe this is like a sage-like person who can sort of, you know, wave her wand and, and help me under earth sort of the mysteries of life that I was exploring at the time. And so I uh, did my best to sort of strategically position myself across the dinner table from her one night. And I kind of went for it. I was like, let's, I want to get spiritually directed, whatever that means. And in this time, I just start throwing all these questions at her. And very quickly, she's like, and if you don't know the spiritual director, you can go to seminary for this stuff. Like, it requires a lot of education. So I was completely off in my understanding of this. But I just start throwing these questions. And she turned to me at one point and she said, Nathan, I think you want like a session. Is that what you're going for here? And I was like, sure. And so all of a sudden, we're in this impromptu spiritual direction session, and I'm sort of bearing my soul to this woman. And she looks at me and she says, I think it helped that maybe we're in a mission trip setting. So she's like, okay, like maybe God's leading me to do this thing. I don't know. So she gave me the time of day and she looked at me after all this and she said, Nathan, you know what? I think at the heart of you is a passion for justice. And in that moment, I was like, yes, you nailed it. That's it. I'd never heard it said to me in that way. I'd never sort of thought about myself in that way, but it so resonated to me. And in particular, I was like, you know how I know that's true? Because when I was in elementary school, I was a loud, obnoxious kid, believe it or not. And I was always getting in trouble with my teachers because I was talking to my neighbor, which who wasn't, but my voice was just louder than everyone else's. And so I got in trouble and I was like, this is not just. And that never went well for me, ever. Um, My wife would tell you that this whole heart of justice, yes, it can be a beautiful thing. Yes, it is in many ways what I think has led me to the role that I'm in at the church now and and, and much of what I've been able to do uh, in the time God's given to me. And yet, it doesn't always serve me well. Um, she would tell you that we, uh, we play soccer regularly in a league together, and often the ref will, make, uh, will blow their whistle and call something that I don't think is quite right. I disagree with it. And very quickly, um, I become what my wife has described as a whiny child. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times we have gotten in the car after our matches, and she'll look at me and she'll, I can see fire in her eyes. And literally, I'm like, I did good. I did good. And she's like, you are an embarrassment. (laughs) So if you play soccer with in a league in Seattle and you may have encountered someone who feels a little bit like an embarrassment, it could be me. Let's talk after the service. I want to make that right. Um, And you might have already checked out um, as soon as you saw it was me up here preaching. But here we go. 
my heart for justice doesn't always uh, manifest itself in such a way that brings about real justice. And I think at some level or another, we all maybe can relate with that, right? We confuse at times our uh, desire to be right with what it is to be in right relationship. Amen? This happens in our family relationships. It happens in our marital relationships. It happens to us on the sports field. It happens to us in our professional settings. The reality is that under all of that, there is some beauty. The beauty is that in all of us, whether you're like me and you have this passion deep within you for justice, or maybe you're sort of like, you know what? Like, yes, I believe in justice, but I would rather sort of just coast along and, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, that kind of thing. That's okay too. All of us, no matter where you are in that spectrum, we have within us, in, as, as sort of image bearers of God, a desire to see justice come about. And what I want to suggest to us at the outset this morning is that indeed justice is, at its sort of core, a work of the heart. It's something that burns within us, but it also requires this. And this is where we're going to dive deeper today. It requires great wisdom, it requires instruction, and understanding its role within God's larger work of restoration in the world. And so there's sort of three aspects of justice that I believe will lead us to a more wise expression of the call that we're going to explore in our time together. And those three are this, the role of justice, the way of justice, and the ends of justice. And under each of these, I have sort of a subtitle for us. And so beginning with the first, the role of justice, what I'd like to suggest is that justice is part of God's ongoing spiritual process of reconciliation. Okay, so let's start there. As we seek to unpack this expansive theme of justice in our lives of discipleship, I believe it's helpful to consider the role that it plays ultimately in God's larger economy. As a church, we've leaned heavily in uh, recent years into the work of local professor and pastor Brenda Salter McNeil. Um, She has a book, Roadmap to Reconciliation, and has been in this work for a very long time. And she defines reconciliation as this the ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and here it is, justice, that transforms broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all of creation to flourish. There's a lot there. What I'd like to suggest today is that justice is indeed part of this threefold threefold strategy of God's reconciliatory work in the world. It includes forgiveness, repentance, and justice. So when we understand justice this way, as sort of a part of a grander spiritual work of restoring broken relationships and broken systems to reflect God's original intention for all of creation to flourish, what it does is it helps us to narrow the scope of what justice is really about, and ultimately what it's for. So as we examine the text for today and this theme, let's bear in mind the work of justice as intimately related with repentance and forgiveness. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you would say that that is the way we're understanding the topic of justice in media today? Not so much, right? It's part of this larger work. And the beautiful thing that we're going to see in the text for today is that in the identity and the person of Jesus, these three are sort of summed up. They're harmonized and synchronized in such a way that is exemplary and it's invitational for all of us. So before we get to the text, what I'd like to do is a short little exercise together. So if you'd be so bold, um, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to pose a series of questions. And together, we're going to uh, sort of begin to use our imaginations, okay? So if you would, just for a moment, go ahead, close your eyes. You're not going to open them and see me in another costume, I promise. Close your eyes and, and, and consider this question. If you were to draw a picture of Jesus, what image comes to your mind? 
If you were to draw a portrait of Christ, what would it look like? And then if you were to position your image of Christ into a scene, what would it be? Where is it? What's happening? Beautiful. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. And as you do, if you would, hold that image in your head because we're going to come back to it in just a little bit. If we were to go around the room and some of you were to share what your picture of Christ looked like and what, what your scene was, I'm willing to bet that we would get a great diversity of expressions. And there's beauty in that. I really think there's beauty in that. For example, we all might have drawn a picture of Jesus that embodies certain character traits of his. For example, um, maybe some of us depicted Christ as a teacher or as a savior or maybe even as a carpenter. The reality is that layered on top of these many different traits of Christ that we know are the multidimensional ways in which we as people of different ethno-racial backgrounds, different genders, nationalities, cultural contexts, vocational pursuits, even just people with different giftings, with different interests, we all are going to encounter and interpret Jesus in our lives uniquely as individuals, as a community, right? And at a level, there's beauty in this. There's a theologian you may know, N.T. Wright, who in his book on the historical Jesus, in which he's sort of seeking to understand the character of Jesus in Jesus's socio-historical context of his time. And, 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 And regarding Jesus, he writes this. Christ's public persona within first century Judaism was that of a prophet. And the content of his prophetic proclamation was the kingdom of Israel's God. However, he goes on to write, the prophetic aspect of Jesus' work is often and surprisingly ignored. Wright argues that Jesus' mission, yes, was about being Messiah and Savior, but we cannot hear this. We cannot understand his mission accurately if we remove him from the tradition of the prophets. How many of you pictured Jesus as a prophet just a few moments ago? You might even be asking, well, what would that even look like? We're about to look at that. So if we turn to our passage for today is that we'll see indeed at the outset of Jesus' public ministry and the account of Luke that Jesus is seen quoting first and foremost a prophet, a prophet Isaiah and Interestingly, what he's declaring, just as N.T. Wright suggests, is this kingdom of God, a kingdom for all people and in all places. And this is what brings us to our second point for the day, the way of justice, which I believe invites all of us to be prophetic, okay? So for context here in Luke's narrative, Jesus has just been baptized by John. The spirit is seen descending on him like a dove and a voice is heard announcing from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I'm well pleased. Then Jesus goes on to spend 40 days in the wilderness where he's tempted by the devil. And then boom, here he's seen returning to Galilee where he goes and he teaches in the synagogues. And at this point, Luke 4, 15 we learn this. At this time, Jesus had been, quote, praised by everyone. Not bad, right? Building a pretty good reputation. Now, this is where we pick up the story. Verse 16, we heard it read by Megan uh, just a moment ago. I'm going to read it again for us. It says this, when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read and on the scroll, uh, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, and he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all in the synagogue, all the eyes of those gathered were fixed on him. And then he begins to say, pause. We're going to come back to it in a moment. What's about to happen is a critical moment where there's a shift in the identity of Jesus, in Jesus's ministry, and ultimately in how people respond to him, okay? Up to this point, Luke's narrative has depicted Jesus as the Messiah, the son of God made known at his baptism. He's also uh, been sort of seen as the savior, the one who has authority over the devil and his schemes. And these are important identities of Jesus, Messiah, Savior. But what we're introduced to here is the Jesus, the prophet. And I believe this is critically important for our topic on justice today. So as the story continues, Jesus closes the scroll, and then he offers a comment. And this was customary. At the end of a reading like this, the person who did the reading, they would offer a comment. And so people are sort of edging towards the, the, the edge of their seat, and they're wondering, okay, what is he going to say about this? And this is what he says. Verse 21, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And what he's saying here is that he himself has received God's spirit and is himself the fulfillment of this prophecy. And this was a prophecy that the people gathered would have been very familiar with. It would have been altogether earth shattering to be told, I'm it. What you've been waiting for. Okay? So at this point, people aren't too upset about it. If anything, they're curious. They're sort of, again, on the edge of their seat. And you can imagine as Jesus is saying this, they're sort of leaning in, wondering, what does this mean? If it's true, what does it mean? (laughs) And then Jesus tells them what it means. He says, first, you're not going to accept me. Oh, and second, he uses their very own scripture to indict them and saying, you've got it wrong. I've come to proclaim the Lord's favor, not just to you Jews, but to the Gentiles as well, to the rest of the world. And in that moment, having just been part of a nation praising this person, everything changes. And what do they do? Does anyone know? They go and they mob him. They try to kill him. I don't know if you've seen the movie Anchorman. Anyone see Anchorman? Terrific flick, if you will. Um, There's a scene, right, where these news media channels have come together. They have this epic brawl. And at the end of it, someone stands up in the center and they look around and they're like, that escalated quickly. You almost killed a guy. That's what's happening right here. You see, why this response? And, And what does this response tell us about justice. Well, Luke's sort of unique telling of of the story of Christ and his encounter in Nazareth presents ultimately a microcosm, a microcosm of the broader gospel narrative. We see it all here just in the text that we've read for today. See, just as in Nazareth, in the broader ministry of Jesus, he has come to proclaim the coming kingdom of God. That's why he came. A truth for which he ultimately would be rejected and crucified. And the people in Nazareth, they loved the Savior part. Just before the text that we read, they'd been desperate asking, Jesus, come, would you heal us? We have all these problems in our community. Deliver us from them. They loved the Messiah, Son of God part. It wasn't until they met Jesus the prophet that they learned what the reality of the kingdom of God would cost them what it would really mean for them, what it would require of them. In the book Kingdom Ethics, the authors write this, 
Indeed, we would say that no Jewish Messiah could be anything other than a prophet of justice to an unjust Israel and an unjust world. See, the role of prophet and justice are integrally linked because the role of prophet, hear this, is to speak a word on behalf of God to his creation. And any word spoken on behalf of God to a broken creation, if indeed God is in the business of reconciliation and restoration, which he is, any word then spoken on behalf of God to his creation is going to necessitate justice. Justice to close the gap between the way that the world is and the way that the kingdom of God, the imago Dei, the image of God is meant to be. And so friends, if we are called to be prophets, which we are, then we are called to be people that name the gap between the way the world is and the way that it is meant to be. See, the role of savior and prophet are indeed inextricably linked in the person of Jesus because, hear me on this, we have to know what we're being saved to. We have to know what we're being reconciled to. Christ came, yes, to reconcile us to himself, to reconcile the broken places within each of us, within our communities, within the rest of creation. But he did this such that we might realize the image of God coming alive in us, alive in our communities in the systems and the structures that organize our lives together, even in the natural creation. This is the kingdom for which we were created, to which we are called to be reconciled to and reconcilers of. Anywhere there is dissonance, and oh, is there dissonance today, amen? Between the way the world is and the way that God envisions it, justice is needed to close that gap. And this brings us to our final point for today, the ends of justice. Justice invites restoration of community. I think the temptation in our pursuits of justice can be to choose sides in such a way that ultimately deteriorates the foundations for community. The context, ironically, within which Jesus demonstrates that justice is indeed meant to be sought and realized is within community. And I get it. I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. I don't want to be on the wrong side of justice. We're sort of left with all these questions. Should we claim this or renounce that? Should I align with this organization or disassociate with that one, with this church or with that one, with evangelicalism or not? Should I march in protest here or there or participate in that parade? Can I renounce violent, hateful acts and own a gun? Can I consume organic fair trade products and on occasion shop at Walmart? Can I passionately believe in the equal treatment and dignity of all people and not know what I believe about same-sex marriage in the church? Friends, on this graduation Sunday, what does biblical justice look like for the transgender SPU student? How about for the queer faculty member or board member or longtime alumni supporter of the institution over the course of generations? These are just some of the many questions we're asking about justice today, are they not? And what Jesus so radically and wisely demonstrates is that justice can only be realized in the context of community. Fragmentation is the enemy of justice. And it's the very thing to which popular media, popular culture would lead us to today. And so, hear me, pursuing justice in community does not exclude confronting injustices within that same community. 
37 times in the gospel accounts, Jesus directly confronts the powers and authorities of his day. These include deliverance of the poor and powerless, confronting the domineering of one group over another, stopping violence and establishing peace, welcoming refugees and outcasts into community. You see, in Jesus's time, there was no shortage of injustice. For example, just another example, 90% of the population were peasant farmers, and yet they were, and they were producing a majority of the wealth. However, just 10% of the economic and religio-political elite occupied over half the resources. Religious and political authorities developed systems and traditions that reinforced the centralization of economic power. Does that sound familiar? You see, this incomprehensible wealth gap, structures that empowered uh, the few at the expense of the majority, the marginalization of ethno-racial groups, oppression of women, violent and unjust laws, Jesus confronts all of these, and he does it in creative, strategic ways that claim the truth of each person's identity being in the imago Dei, the image of God, and worthy of a life characteristic of nothing less in the kingdom of God, one of shared flourishing for all. And you know what? He was killed for it. So you see, what I believe is so important for us and and practical in our culture today is this, that if justice, along with repentance and forgiveness, recall what I mentioned earlier about Dr. Brenda's work, the necessity of justice and repentance and forgiveness to be a part of this broader work of reconciliation that is to happen in the context of broken relationships between people, God, ourselves, the rest of creation, and the structures and systems that sort of circulate around all of these. Then, if that's what it's about, justice must come about in relationships and our shared lives together. This is where Jesus went, to renounce injustice and where he sought to restore justice in relationship with other people, often unlike him, restoring community. You see, he did not align himself with a perfect organization. He didn't sort of like buy their t-shirt and plaster their logo all over his water bottle. Jesus didn't come to establish the perfect church and stream his sermons out to the rest of the world, right? No. What did he do? He got together a ragtag group of nobodies and he built a community. He showed them the way of love and of compassion. And then they went and did the same. Occasionally, he would use words to name the gap between the way the world is and the way that God desires it to be. Friends, that's what it is to be prophetic. We're going to close with this illustration. Um, Some of you may know that we uh, here at the church have had a partnership in Rwanda with an organization, World Relief, for a little over a decade now. And if you don't know, the history of Rwanda is such that in 1994, there was a mass genocide, a mass genocide in which over a million people died in a matter of 100 days, okay? Now, what's profoundly interesting um, from a sort of historical perspective is that at the time, over 90% of the country was Christian. And so, in a country of that size, that meant that everyone was either a perpetrator or a victim, and no one was free of what happened. Meaning there were brothers and sisters from neighboring churches who were literally killing each other. And so, in a setting like that, the question was raised, what is justice? We can't lock up over half the country. What are we going to do? And what they did was a series of things, one of which was called the Gachacha Trials. And the Gachacha Trials were essentially truth-telling committees in which they would gather people in, in their communities, facilitated by a community leader of some kind, and they would have people come and tell the truth about what they did with the very people with, that suffered as a consequence in the room. And what's so radical about this, yes, incredibly traumatic, but what happened was there was a foundation of repentance that was beginning to be laid. 
And as a result of that repentance, forgiveness. Over the course of years, yes, but eventually forgiveness. And on the far side of that, World Relief uh, has been partnered with Bethany in, in the work of uniting local churches to serve the most vulnerable together. And what we've seen is a group of 10 churches grow to a group of over 200 churches just in one region alone, impacting over 200,000 people. And these churches represent every denomination under the sun. You've got Episcopalians and Baptists and Pentecostals all working together to address the needs of their community. It's beautiful work. But that restorative work, restorative justice work, did not happen without the foundation of repentance and forgiveness. And if you know the history of Rwanda, you may know that there's a whole lot of Western country tampering with what ultimately happened there. And it's sort of been my passion in my time traveling back and forth and, and getting to really become genuine friends with, with folks there to sort of, in, within, within reach for me, right some of that wrong. And so uh, I've sought to sort of take the inspiration of, of that work of uniting local churches uh, to serve the most vulnerable and bring it here to Seattle. And so um, what we started to do here on Aurora, you may have heard me talk about this before, is uh, have a series of meetings with local churches coming around Aurora Commons and saying, there's a homelessness crisis here in our city that we cannot deny. What would it look like to address those things together? I can tell you that uh, what, what, what Rwandans taught me is that we needed to start with repentance and forgiveness. And so me and another um, lay leader from the congregation, a woman named Melissa Gossiens, went on a series of meetings with these local pastors of other churches right here on the Aurora Corridor. And we started to have reconciliatory conversations where we said, hey, we're that big church by the lake. Um, how are you? And we learned of a lot of hurts over the years. We learned of a lot of ways in which we came up short and vice versa. And we started to lay a foundation of unity built on a shared desire to see one another restored to relationship and ultimately all of us as a community restored to more wholeness together, those living outside and those of us with the comfort of our own home. I can tell you the work that we've done together has been nothing short of the most rewarding work that I've been a part of in my short little missional career. But it's true. This can happen. And it can happen if we take seriously the call that anything worthy of God's justice in the world must be built on a foundation of repentance and forgiveness with an eye towards reconciliation. So as we prepare to close, and I'll invite the band back up, uh, I'd like you to, if you would, for a moment, just close your eyes again and recall that image of Christ that we painted together earlier. As you kind of bring that image back into view, what I'd like you to do is to insert the faces of those that represent an injustice happening in the world today. As those people enter the scene, let me ask you these couple things. First this, where are you? And as these others enter the scene, how does Jesus respond to them? Is there a shift in his posture? Does the feeling in the room or in the setting you've drawn up, does it change a bit? Go ahead and open your eyes. We're going to respond in worship now. And as we do, there's a little inserted card in your bulletin, and it gives you the space to write a question. And it's up here on the screen as well. But if you would, write this question, and you can consider it, yes, in our time of worship now, but also in the week ahead. Picture Jesus sitting in a setting of injustice today. Question for you is this, how will you join the scene? Let's pray. Father, we just humbly put ourselves at your feet. We ask the question, Lord, of you, would you break our hearts for the things that break yours? Lord, thank you that you have come to save us. Lord, you've come to be near to us in all of our individual and unique stories. But Lord, you've also come to bring about a kingdom that's not for each of us alone. It can only be realized together. So God, whatever it takes for us to see and appreciate your image imprinted upon another, 
such that we ourselves could be part of your justice work in the world. May it be so. Shape us around your heart, we pray in these times of worship. Amen. Let's worship together.